Hello everyone and welcome back to Schedule School. Uh, today is seminar four and we are talking about a fairly hot topic in the wake of Swift versus Carpenter, which is accommodation. I am joined by Karen Hunt, who hosted seminar two, and also our speaker today, who will be guiding us through it, is Sarah Crowther QC, and both Sarah and Karen are at Outer Temple Chambers. Just by way of reminder, in terms of where we're up to, for those of you who haven't visited the website at www.schedulschool.co.uk, you will see on there that we have a fictional case study of Penny Foster, and we're using that to work through all of the heads of loss when forming a schedule. Just by way of reminder of Penny's circumstances, uh, Penny Foster was born on the 23rd of May, 1983, and on the 17th of March, 2019, uh, she was in, involved in a road traffic accident, uh, which has rendered her paraplegic. You will see on the screen now that in red, we have dealt with her accommodation. So the two bedroom terraced house, which Penny owned pre-accident, was unsuitable for her needs. And as a result, Penny is currently renting an accessible bungalow and continues to undergo intensive therapy. So Karen, do you want to tell us what we'll be going through today in relation to accommodation? Yes, thank you, Lois. Um, so the purpose of this seminar is really to make sure that you can perform um, the necessary calculation to, to compensate for special accommodation, given the new situation after Swift and Carpenter. So first, we'll talk very briefly about special accommodation. What is it? Hopefully you already know. Um, then we'll look at RVJ, which was the previous way um, special accommodation claims were valued. And then we'll talk about how things are now um, following the Swift and Carpenter judgment, which tells us how to calculate going forward. So that's going to include looking at what on earth reversionary interest is, how to perform the new calculation, and then we'll also demonstrate the new calculation using Penny's specific circumstances. And then last but not least, we'll just give you a few red flag areas that weren't dealt with squarely in Swift and Carpenter and which you need to be aware of, um, depending on the facts of your particular case. Um, so with that in mind, um, just very briefly for anyone who doesn't know, special accommodation um, is a head of loss that arises if a client's injuries are so severe um, that their current accommodation um, or their current renting situation, whatever it may be, is no longer suitable for their needs and they require um, a different type of accommodation and often it's um, a single story property if there's mobility issues, the use of a wheelchair, something like that. That's kind of the standard case that we're thinking about. Um, and there may be also different kinds of adaptions. If someone's going to have to have um, full time carers, they're going to need a bigger space for the carers to be accommodated in as well. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. And you'll have heard in the other seminars, particularly Ben Bradley, also from Outer, um, talking about sort of the test of reasonableness um, for, for what's needed when you're assessing this. And obviously the key thing is that you're going to have an expert who's going to have gone through what are the claimant's needs um, and what kind of house is required. And you have specific experts who will tell you, A, what kind of square footage, what kind of features the property has to have. And then they'll also do a scan of properties in the area um, so that you can actually come up with sort of the viable property um, for the claimant to live in um, so that you know what you're working with. Um, so going forward then, Lois, why don't you tell us, um, with the help of Sarah, about um, the way things were done prior to the Swift and Carpenter case. So how did these claims used to work? Um, absolutely. You will have seen um, at the moment that all legal commentaries are on Swift versus Carpenter. But before that decision, there was a very well established precedent. And we'll be going through the formula that's on the screen now. Um, but Sarah, Roberts versus Johnston, do you want to talk through how that came about and the principles that were applied when looking at that? Yes, thank you both um, ladies, although at this point I am feeling a little bit like you've brought the old lady in to explain how the law used to be. Anyway, here goes. <laughs> um, the idea um, in Roberts and Johnston was to grasp the nettle that um, Karen mentioned when we looked at the previous slide, which is that accommodation, capital accommodation cost claims 
are unique in personal injury damages because you're looking at purchasing an asset which is likely to appreciate over time, whereas most of the other heads of loss um, relate either to expenses or to uh, purchases of uh, things which will effectively depreciate. So the idea of the Robertson Johnston calculation was the court's attempt to, to tackle this problem of appreciation and the windfall and to allow the claimant enough money to purchase the house, but then also to offset, to try to reflect the uh, windfall element in the damages. Um, and the, the route that was chosen, and, and this is really the kind of key ratio of, of Roberts, is, is, is you're not compensating, therefore, for the additional capital value of the required property. What you're doing with the Roberts and Johnston calculation, or what you used to do, is you would look at the annual loss which was incurred by a claimant due to the loss of income from the capital which had been spent on property instead. In other words, the idea was that if you'd been able to invest that money, the additional sum, how much would it have earned? In other words, how much, and that was the way that the loss was being calculated. And this resulted in the formula that you see on the screen, which is additional capital costs multiplied by the discount rate, multiplied by the life multiplier for um, the claimant. Um, and obviously then Wells and Wells came along afterwards and uh, the discount rate um, was set subsequently by Lord Chancellor in the pursuit of the powers in, in the Damages Act. Um, and so uh, this was all fine where the positive discount rate was 2.5% and you can see on the slide the calculation. Um, two things then happen. One, in fact, um, property prices did not necessarily take the same course in terms of appreciation as they historically had done. But more significantly, once the discount rate was reviewed and became a negative discount rate, um, at minus 0.25%, you can see from the slide there that the moment you stick a minus figure in, it simply doesn't work. Well, save that it could almost result um, in a situation where the defendant might say to the claimant, well, actually, you owe me money. Um, so there was clearly then an issue following the change in the discount rate as to how um, losses for uh, capital accommodation, special accommodation needs could possibly be met. Um, that left um, the law obviously with a bit of a gap in it. There were then some high court decisions in which uh, judges felt that they were unable to depart from the Robertson Johnston formula. Um, and effectively made nil awards um, for special accommodation um, costs. Um, then came along the case of Swift against Carpenter. Um, it's a road traffic accident claim. Mrs. Swift um, unfortunately had very severe leg injuries and had to have um, a below knee uh, amputation. Um, and the claim in her case related to a property in London um, and she had a property already which was valued just shy of 1.5 million pounds um, and so Mrs Justice Lambert who was the judge at first instance made various findings of fact as to the cost of the property which would have been required um, uh, which was about 2.35 million so there was a significant capital shortfall of some 900,000 pounds um, but she then, uh, in line with previous decisions, um, held that she was bound by Roberts and Johnston, uh, which is a matter of strict precedent, um, it seemed probably to be the right decision. Um, uh, but obviously, in view of the unsatisfactory circumstances in which that left the claimant's claim, she was happy to give permission to appeal on the point of principle. Um, and so the case then came in front of the Court of Appeal. And what was slightly unusual about the history of the case was that, at first instance, um, neither of the parties had laid before the court any materials on which the court might have conducted the exercise of assessing the loss by reference to different principles. And so the Court of Appeal had to decide what approach to take, and it took the rather unusual step of agreeing itself to hear the expert evidence and effectively factual evidence almost at first instance and um, obviously based very much on the findings of fact which Mrs Justice Lambert had already made from the accommodation experts and so the Court of Appeal heard expert evidence from economists, mortgage experts 
um, a surveyor and also experts in uh, in calculating uh, niche experts in calculating what's known as the reversionary interest in property and um, uh, that meant that a number of issues before the court of appeal uh, the first was was the court of appeal itself bound by um, the court of appeals previous decision in Roberts and Johnston um, which um, raised a kind of technical issue of precedent interesting for nerds like me um, but essentially um, the court um, stepped around that by saying that although um, it was technically binding precedent the rules that had been laid down in Roberts and Johnston were not rules of strict law but were rather guidance to the lower courts in terms of how to assess um, damages and so having found themselves sufficient wiggle room they then moved on to the next question which was what were the options available to the court of appeal in order to provide appropriate compensation which would um, enable the claimant to be adequately compensated without generating uh, a windfall and there were various options that had originally been laid out by the parties um, one was to look at interest only mortgage backed by a periodical payment order uh, another was to look at uh, mortgage payments or even mortgage interest payments um, using a kind of interest only mortgage vehicle rather than a capital repayment model and then to factor that in by the life multiplier uh, another um, sub option there was to look at rental costs on the life multiplier as opposed to mortgage payments and there was even a suggestion that um, the defendant could purchase the property needed uh, uh, and then to effectively become mortgagor or lender to the claimant uh, with some kind of charge over the property. Um, it's fair to say that that kind of creative option uh, didn't, didn't go very far because of the various strict financial regulatory regimes which would have been engaged by that kind of model um, amongst other difficulties. Um, and the Personal Injury Bar Association um, intervened uh, in the appeal and also was um, uh, uh, instructive in, in, in obtaining and, and making sure that the right expert evidence was before the court. So, having looked at the kind of smorgasbord before it, the Court of Appeal decided that the viable option in terms of actually calculating the loss is the reversionary interest model. So I know you're all waiting with bated breath to find out what is a reversionary interest. And some of you whose memories are longer than mine will remember your equity um, uh, tutorials um, um, and property law. Um, but essentially what happens in a trust is that um, you can have a reversionary interest where the remainder interest in property reverts back to the settlor of the trust when the prior interest comes to an end. So the slide here sets out an example. So if there is a property and somebody, a settlor gives a, a life tenancy of that um, property, um, once the life tenant dies, then obviously um, the interest in the property reverts back to um, the settlor or to whoever the settlor has has given the reversionary interest to so um, that means that the life tenant um, obviously doesn't have the benefit of that property um, and that's why the model was of interest to the Court of Appeal because it in essence reflected what it was trying to achieve when compensating the claimant it was to give the claimant sufficient interest in a property for the rest of her life so that she could live in the accommodation that she reasonably needed but not such that it would benefit her estate upon her death. Now the next stage which was um, to look at what is um, the reversionary interest um, involved a lot of discussion about being the remainder man um, which isn't actually the fifth beetle or some other kind of um, strange uh, concept but it is the person to whom the property reverts once the uh, prior interest has, has ended and and apparently these do actually have a market value although having read the case it's very clear that it's an incredibly niche market um, um, you know so small as to be almost difficult to measure in market terms however um, the Court of Appeal accepted that the evidence was sufficient that you could um, 
rely upon it in order to identify what the value would be um, uh, to the remainder man. And having heard all of that evidence and, and weighed it all up, they decided that basically the thing to do is to adopt a rate of return of 5% reflect the reversionary interest value. Now, you'll be pleased to hear that our brief foray into property law um, has now come <laughs> to an end. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> we can actually have a look at how you do it. So um, what you're doing, remember, is you are looking at the value of the property, you're trying to take away the value of the reversionary interest and then create, bearing in mind the life multiplier, um, the correct calculation of the capital sum, which uh, represents um, the loss. And I'm going to hand over to Karen now because um, I've just seen the formula in the middle of that page and it's made my eyes go a little bit um, uh, cross-eyed. And Karen can explain to you um, what we are doing here and why this, this magic formula, although the explanation is very complicated, actually has resulted in a reasonably simple way of calculating these losses now. Yes, that is definitely the good news that even if Swift and Carpenter sort of causes you a bit of, of stress and consternation, all you really need to know um, is what is on this slide. And thank you so much, Sarah, for, for going through all of those points. That's really helpful. And I certainly already understand it better than I did before. Um, but yes, so what you need, first, make sure you have um, the value of the property that's required. Your, your accommodation expert is going to have told you that the value of the property that the claimant is living in or would have bought anyway, um, if maybe they're a young claimant who, who haven't moved out of home yet or something like that, um, and the predicted life expectancy. Um, and using those, you're able to get to what the reversionary interest is. And you do that simply by first um, determining the additional capital cost. So just take away the cost of the new property um, or rather the cost of the current property from the cost of the new property, that's P minus B there um, in the formula. Um, and then you're multiplying that by um, 1.05, which represents the 5% the reversionary interest, but to the power of the negative predicted life expectancy. And multiplying those together you get the reversionary interest and you can do that calculation either on a scientific calculator you just need to use the little x to the y um, button make sure you keep the minus um, or you can also perform it on excel it has that functionality um, and so once you've got the reversionary interest you simply subtract it from the additional capital cost that's required and that tells you what the damages um, are going to be so we've applied that in Penny's case just to see what it looks like with the numbers actually in there. Um, we've got Penny um, with a life expectancy of 38 more years. Um, we've just used that um, a simple number for, for the purposes of the calculation. We know that her pre-injury home, as Lois said, isn't suitable for her needs, um, and she's going to require a new home at a cost of 900,000. She'll be able to sell her current home for 600,000. Um, so you'll see how we've put that into the formula there. We've gotten about 46 or almost 47 grand in reversionary interest, and we've taken that away from the 300,000, which is the difference or what Penny needs to buy her new house. Um, and so Penny would get in this case, um, 200. 53,000 and then obviously in practice what would happen would would be that you know she'd use from other heads of loss to make up the difference that's needed to buy the house and um, so that's what it looks like in practice and it's worth saying as well um, that that formula is actually so easy you can even do it on your iPhone uh, as I understand it so it, it, it's a big sigh of relief if you're like me and you don't really like formulas because it's, it's quite a nice one to do. Um, the slide that's just come up on your screen now uh, deals with something that in catastrophic injury claims are commonplace and that's adaptations and betterment. And Swift versus Carpenter remained silent on those points. Understandably, it was about finding a new way to deal with the negative discount rate. Uh, but that rather leaves the question as how that should be dealt with. And um, Sarah, what's your view on that and how you would approach this pragmatically? Well, I think inevitably when you get um, accommodation expert evidence, um, either you're looking at 
building a, a specialist property from scratch, in which case um, you, you maybe not have all these problems. But in most situations, what you're really looking at is purchase of an existing property and then adapting it in order to meet those needs. And obviously the adaptation will bring cost, um, but it also brings with it the possibility that the property at the end will be worth more than it would have been in its unadapted state. And I think it just doesn't reflect the uh, reality of the exercise in assessing damages for those two features not to be taken into account. So we have to do something to adjust um, uh, in order to do that. Um, now, um, if you're asking, do we adjust the formula? I would say no. Um, what we've done here on this slide, I think, reflects um, what you would end up doing in practice, which is to um, adjust the purchase price um, um, or, I suppose, the, the um, uh, remainder price. It doesn't really matter as long as it goes on one or the other. So here what we've done is we've um, said, well, the adaptation is going to cost £100,000. Um, but in fact, um, the property at the end will end up being worth uh, £50,000 more than the £900,000 we said. So one add in one, take away the other, you get 950 and then you can do your calculation. So um, that's how it has um, played out in, in that particular example. Um, I have to say, in my experience, um, when you're acquiring, um, say, bungalows, three bedroom bungalows and um, making adaptations to them, that, they, that, that figure can be considerably more than um, £100,000. So it's important not to forget it because it can have a, a very significant impact um uh on the schedule um obviously there's always room for argument about what the betterment figure might look like in the end that is very much a question of um expert opinion um and again always room for argument but that's in principle i think how it it, it fits within this new new way of um assessing um i don't know lois or karen if you've got your own thoughts about that if I'm totally wrong or <laughs> if there is anything else that um, needs to be taken into account on those issues. No, it seems to me the, the right way to go about it, really. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect to have something better than Sarah Crowder on that. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, about I'm just, that. I'm, I'm <laughs> not being wisely. Yeah, um, perfect. Well, that deals with that. And um, that is a swift run through, where hey, um, on the principles that were um, in play before and how Swift and Carpenter gives you this formula uh, for your schedule in effect. But because lawyers are lawyers, as soon as the decision of Swift and Carpenter came out, the question, uh, you know, we got this beautifully simple formula and, and life's great. So of course the question had to be, well, when doesn't it apply? And when doesn't it work? And what do we do in those circumstances? And obviously the focus of schedule school has been on Penny Foster and it's likely in Penny's scenario that this would work. Um, but one needs to think about points of wider implication uh, and there's many of those, but there's a few on the screen now. Uh, Sarah, we wanted to go through firstly when one may be able to depart from the formula in Swift versus Carpenter. Um, yeah. Could you talk through that? Well, obviously I talked earlier about the kind of wiggle room that the Court of Appeal gave itself in terms of um, looking at Roberts and Johnson and, and declaring it to be guidance rather than strict law. Well, that that was um, helpful for the Court of Appeal in that it allowed it to go on to look at the merits of, of the case in SWIFT. But of course, it has a bit of a lasting legacy because it means that the status of SWIFT itself surely falls into the same category. So again, what we're looking at here really is guidance on a legal principle rather than um, firm law itself. Um, uh, anyway, I make no observations as to the wisdom or otherwise of that approach, but it does mean that for lawyers out there, there is always um, uh, a glimmer of hope that, you know, there's some mileage to be had in arguing a bit about it. Um, uh, one of the areas that um, the Court of Appeal um, did foresee, um, Lord Justice Irwin, who gave um, the, the main judgment, which is... Uh, if I may say, an absolute tour de force of all the evidence and the authorities. But he did flag up at paragraph 171 that there are different considerations that apply where there is a particularly short expectation uh, of life. Um, 
And uh, I mean, I personally have been um, involved in cases where um, the the life expectation has been 10 years or less. And the reality is that none of these formulas work particularly well in, in that situation at all. And I think from a claimant's perspective, um, one would have to start by um, suggesting that the full capital cost of um, the special accommodation ought to be the method of calculating it there. But again, SWIFT itself doesn't say that. Um, and uh, one can see that it might be fact sensitive. I mean, sometimes um, defendants like to suggest that um, rental is a suitable um, alternative. Um, that that potentially could be a, a means of calculating the loss, save that, um, in my experience, on the expert accommodation evidence, it's rather unlikely that the experts would conclude that rental was in the claimant's, um, uh, you know, would meet the, the claimant's reasonable need um, for a couple of main reasons. One is that landlords are generally reluctant to permit the kind of substantial adaptations to properties that claimants need to undertake. And secondly, because they don't have the security of tenure. So it wouldn't be um, a prudent investment, uh, particularly in a deputy case, for example, for significant um, investment to be made in a property which is only held on an assured shorthold tenancy. So, um, uh, you know, taking all of that into account, um, I, I think it's unlikely in many cases that a judge is going to be comfortable to say to a claimant or a claimant's deputy that the claimant has to rent. Um, so I think probably that's a very long-winded way of saying you might get the full capital cost if the life expectation is 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 short is shorter than the kind of cases that they're looking at um, in Swift. Um, and the other situation that they looked at was this possibility of major economic change, um, which of course I think when Roberts and Johnston was decided, nobody ever um, thought for a second that. Um, uh, it, 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 that kind of thing could happen. But of course, the banking crisis and the pandemic have demonstrated to us that things can change um, very significantly. Um, I'm not sure um, what the court would do in that situation, to be honest. Um, it might be that we'd have to have the new guideline test case in order to tell us what to do in the new economic um, circumstances. Um, so uh, I'm not sure... Um, what other situations we could um, think of at the moment um, in terms of what might happen to take you outside Swift and Carpenter? I don't know, Lois, you look like you've got an idea. No, I'm, I'm just thinking earlier as we were talking about the fact that Roberts was simply guidance as how to approach a positive discount rate. So presumably if the discount rate was to go to positive again, then Roberts just kicks back in. Well, that is a very interesting question, isn't it? Because there's no obvious reason why it should <laughs> um, necessarily, because what they have done is made a departure in principle as to what the exercise is here. So under Roberts and Johnston, as I say, what the court mm. landed upon was the notion that the claimant needed to be reimbursed or compensated for the uh, loss of interest on the notional capital sum that they could have invested. Um, whereas the focus in SWIFT is very much more on the claimant's mm. needs to purchase a specific property. And so I think it's far from clear that even if the discount mm. rate were to revert to positive, that that would signal a need for a departure from the SWIFT and, and Carpenter um principles it might obviously mean a tweak to the form possibly mean tweaks to the formula maybe but um yeah. uh, in, in terms of the the overarching approach it seems to me that um i think it would be difficult now for the court to go back to the the old style of roberts and johnson of viewing it as a, a loss of a chance of an investment rather than the need to purchase a specific property for a specific need um There'll be a range of views on that, Lois. You ask some other silks. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
that's <laughs> certainly lots for everyone watching um, to think about <laughs> and just important red flags for the fact that every case is going to be different and you're going to have to think about all of those factors going forward. And um, But hopefully that's given you what you need um, to start drafting schedules for a special accommodation. Um, and thank you so much, Sarah, for, for giving us all that information and your time. Um, it's been really nice. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. Um, thank you, everyone. And um, just so you know, there's a few other points that we raised there, basically as thinking points. There's no real right answer on anything um, at the moment in terms of Swift and Carpenter. Um, I've done another webinar where it's completely different views on certain things and everybody has a different view, but it's just good to get you thinking. Um, as always, there will be a worksheet to accompany this seminar, which will be on the website. And there will also be the slides available. Um, next time we will be dealing with loss of earnings and we have a very exciting speaker. And um, so hopefully you can join us for that. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.